الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما خلقت الجن والإنس إلا ليعبدون ما أريد منهم مرزق وما أريد أن يتئمون إن الله والرزاق ذو القوة المتين صدق الله اللذيم This is from Surah Zariyat Chapter number 51 اور میں نے اور میں نے جنات اور انسان کو اس کے سوا کسی اور کام کے لیے پیدا نہیں کیا کہ وہ میری عبادت کریں میں کسی سے کسی سے قسم کی رزق نہیں چاہتا اور نہ یہ چاہتا ہوں کہ وہ مجھے کھلائے اللہ تو خود کی رزاق ہے بہت زیادہ رزق دینے والا ہے اور مضبوط قوت والا ہے صدق اللہ لذیم Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Basha. Um, Dr. Siddiq, the yes. podium is all yours. We'll, I'll mute everyone and I'd request all the participants to turn off their videos as well, please. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu wa rizwanahu wa afuanahu wa ufranahu. Hope everyone is doing good, uh, safe and sound. Uh, uh is is everybody able to see my screen yeah i can uh, see it loud and clear yes. i'll get the, get the response on the chat later on thank you okay fine yeah thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh the organizing committee and the gdp for giving me an opportunity to talk uh on this um well in the in the beginning let me let me just briefly introduce you on on the subject today oral cavity is nothing new to us being dentist it is it is our uh, daily routine that we have to look at the oral cavity and um, at the same time we have to see some kind of uh, uh, you know variations the normal aspects and further then uh, when it is progressed to a lesion so i'll i'll just be briefing you on this uh, some normal components of the oral cavity uh, some variations of normal Uh, and then further with lesions. I, I, we'll be starting with uh, different components of the oral cavity that is starting from the lip, the labial mucosa, the buccal mucosa, the vestibule, um, the, the soft palate, the hard palate, the alveolar mucosa, the floor of the mouth, then finally the tongue, which is, which is a very important organ or which is a very important part of the oral cavity. So we, we are going to talk about the different variations uh, and then further lesions. Why uh, are we concentrating here on the variation is uh, because it is, it is mandatory to know about the variations because until and unless we have an idea about what exactly are variations or what exactly are lesions, it would, it would probably, uh, probably become very difficult for us to come to a conclusion or come to a diagnosis. So this is what uh, today's topic is all about. Uh, so let's begin with that. Uh, uh, Dr. Ali has already given my uh, introduction. Thank you very much for uh, the sweet introduction. And uh, this is where I work. Uh, I work in the uh, Department of Maxillofacial Surgery and Diagnostic Sciences in King Saud bin Abdulaziz University of Health Sciences, which belongs to the Ministry of National Guard Health Affairs in uh, Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So uh, before we go, let, let, let me just brief you on why do we call or what exactly is a variation or what do we mean or what do we think or what what exactly is a variation or the exact meaning of variation so some oral conditions basically we we know the structures orally like the the labial mucosa the 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 buccal mucosa and uh, the floor of the mouth the tongue the hot palate the soft palate and then further oropharynx and and uh, and all these components so the, the physical changes of these oral structures can slightly vary, but that doesn't mean that that, that requires any kind of medical intervention to, cut, to correct it, or it, it doesn't affect the, the routine or the regular function. So this is what we mean as uh, basically a variation, but the lesion is something different, different. It is a pathology. When we call it as a lesion, lesion is a pathology. So that needs some kind of treatment and that needs some kind of medical intervention and that needs some kind of diagnostic uh, 
uh, tests to uh, to come to our diagnosis or to diagnose what exactly it is. But a variation of normal, it is it is just a physical change in the appearance of what exactly, and then it, it doesn't need any kind of uh, medical intervention or it doesn't harm or it doesn't affect the daily routine activities uh, which usually uh, happen. So this is about the major difference. So uh, be, uh, today we are going to try concentrate more on the oral mucosal structures or the oral structures. So before I, I start with that, let me let me just give you a brief introduction on what is an epithelium and uh, how does the turnover of this epithelium takes place and what are the exact things which we need to know or which we are uh, you know not aware of possibly I mean most of the people would know about this but still let me let me just brief you on this so the oral mucosa it consists of uh, you know the epithelium as well as the connective tissue component the uh, the epithelial component has different layers and the epithelium is also divided into keratinized and non keratinized epithelium in the keratinized epithelium we have uh, 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 in the keratinized epithelium we have um, uh, different layers of if you can if you can just see this these are the different layers of cells which are arranged here so first thing is the basal layer below this we have lamina propria uh, don't get confused Use yourself with lamina dura. Lamina dura is a different component. Here we have lamina propria. So this is the basal component. Furthermore, if we if we just go to the the surface layer or the uppermost surfaces, we have different layers. We have uh, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, and stratum corneum in a keratinized mucosa. And in a non-keratinized mucosa, we have stratum basal, stratum intermedium, and stratum superficial. So these are the uh, different layers of the epithelium and here uh, if you can just see these are the different types of keratin which are present in the different layers of uh, the epithelial structures and these these are associated with different diseases so this is basically a brief introduction so this epithelium has got a turnover rate that is every individual cell which is seen in the epithelium here has to be squamate Desquamate in the sense it has to uh, exfoliate or probably uh, in local language or in the local words we can say that the uh, the cell has to die. So this in the different epithelial surfaces that is in the keratinized surfaces and the non-keratinized surfaces the time varies that is the desquamation or the turnover time varies that is it could possibly be uh, 30 days it could possibly be uh, maybe we can approximate it and say it is from 17 to 30 days possibly. So this is about the brief introduction of uh, uh, the mucosal structure or the mucosal surfaces and uh, uh, the, the underlying connective tissue component. Why the underlying connective tissue component becomes important because most of the lesions or most of the lesions are involved are involving this connective tissue components also the connective tissue components we usually see the capillaries the blood vessels the collagen the fibroblast and much deeper to that we can see the muscle tissue so this is a basic idea about what mu oral mucosa is all about uh, let's let's begin with our actual talk for today uh, so these are the normal structures uh, lip vermilion and the mucosa why i'm highlighting vermilion here is this is the vermilion portion of the lip mucosa and this is the lip this is the intraoral uh, labial mucosa uh, the best part here that is the labial mucosa when it is stretched uh, when we do a bidigital palpation on this we have a nodular appearance it is not as smooth and as elastic as uh, the buccal mucosa uh, the nodular appearance is basically the presence of minor salivary glands so this is the best place to locally assess the salivary flow here uh, if you can just stretch this mucosal surface like uh, as is shown in the picture and try to dry the surface area using a piece of gauze and observe that area for say around 30 to 40 seconds you can see that uh, the, the area is completely becoming moist and you have the glossy appearance of that surface because the saliva is uh, you know getting secreted from the uh, the, the minor salivary glands. So this is one thing about the labial mucosa and 
this is the vermilion border of the lip. Uh, I, I'll just tell you why I'm highlighting on this vermilion border because the vermilion border way becomes very important when we are going to the variations in the later stages. The first thing I would like to discuss here in the, uh, uh, the variation of normal in the lip mucosa is this is this is classic. This is classic of a four days granule. Now four days granule, see the, the speciality about this, if they are just within this or just below this vermilion border, it is called as four days granules. And if it is appearing anywhere other than this, it is we cannot call this as a four days granule. Four days granules are basically uh, ectopic sebaceous glands. Ectopic in the sense which are not actually present in the area where they are supposed to be present. So this, this is about the four days granules. Uh, I, I mean, we'll be talking much about four days granules when we are talking about uh, the buccal mucosa and four days granules. The most commonest site for a four days granule is the labial mucosa and the, buc the buccal mucosa. Then further on, we'll proceed to uh, uh, actinic chilosis. Actinic chilosis uh, here, this is actually a uh, uh, precancerous or a pre-malignant lesion, we can call it as, uh, most commonly associated with ultraviolet radiations from the sun uh, and seen in people who are uh, outdoor, uh, uh, people who are working outdoors in the fields or possibly any other occupation which uh, which uh, the people are in direct contact with the sunlight is seen in uh, older fair skinned individuals most probably the importance of vermilion border comes here see when 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 it is actinic chilosis there is no vermilion border it looks like as if the skin surface is merging within the uh, the labial mucosa or the lip itself so this is the normal, the initial stages where we, we cannot, we cannot, we can only see some kind of mild fissures here on the labial surface. And furthermore, when we, when we proceed and it aggravates or the disease, when, when, when the disease progresses, we can see the crusting of the, uh, the labial surface here, wherein uh, some amount of uh, crust or seen here. So this is basically about uh, actinic chilosis. It is, we can say it is, um, in the early stage, the lower lip is red, a tropic uh, with uh, intervening pale areas of uh, pale red areas, which shows or possibly which is associated with the loss of vermilion border of the lips. This is actinic chilosis. Then we have exfoliative chilitis, exfoliation, that is exfoliation of the cells. The cells are shedding. Uh, this is what we can see the exfoliate utilitis. Basically, it starts with a single fissure in the center of the labial mucosa or maybe in the lip, uh, uh, characterized by fissuring, disquamation, um, uh, hemorrhagic crusts. These are the hemorrhagic crust. This, 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 this similar appearance is a classic feature of erythema multiforme again, so which uh, is a uh, uh, autoimmune disorder, the erythema multiforme. So hemorrhagic crusts are seen, um, maybe uh, associated with patients who have got uh, some lip licking habits, uh, uh, biting, lip biting habits, and uh, uh, possibly due to some contact allergens also. Um, and some of the cases, uh, this can be associated with some system conditions like thyroid disorders, uh, which have been reported uh, the literature. Uh, this is also a possibility or uh, this is also, but the actual clinical feature of this is it, it basically starts with one single fissure in the center of the lip and then, then spreads to a wider area, which, which something becomes like this. So here we can see uh, the exfoliate utilitis and uh, to a certain extent, if you can observe this picture, uh, it is associated with angular chilitis also, and there is no proper demarcation of the vermilion border here. If you can see here, the lower lip, it looks like as if the, the, the labial mucosa is completely merging with the skin surface. Uh, there's no proper demarcation, but at the same time, when we can try observing here, uh, this is the vermilion border. So this is about exfoliative chilitis. Then when, when we come uh, to the intraoral labial mucosa, this, the, the, the lip can be divided. This, this part is actually considered as an extraoral component. We don't consider this as an intraoral component because it is visible even when the mouth is closed. So when we come to the intraoral component, mucosal, I mean, look at the lesion, look at, look at the beauty of that lesion. I mean, it is, it is so small, the color of the lesion. So to tell you about mucosal, mucosal is basically um, 
you know, it is a mucus extravasation phenomena. There are two types. One is the retention phenomena and the extravasation phenomena. What exactly happens in the retention phenomena is when the when there is some kind of obstruction in the excretory duct. So because of this obstruction, the, the saliva flow is obstructed and because of that, it, it gives rise to a swelling. This is what we call it as extravasation because the duct is not injured and the saliva is not coming out. So this is what we can call it as retention. I'm, I'm sorry, it is not extravasation, it is a retention. So when we talk about extravasation, that the, the saliva or the components of the duct are getting spilled out of the ductal uh, lining or the ductal structure that is due to some kind of injury or anything as such. This is two different types. That is the retention phenomena and the extravasation phenomena. Basically, when we are talking about mucosal, uh, the same mucosal, uh, uh, the, uh, the mucosal, when, when it is seen on the floor of the mouth, it is termed as ranula, but it is uh, on the labial mucosa. It is uh, the mucosal, which is usually, see, uh, if we can try to correlate this, this is near the corner of uh, the mouth, basically. Uh, possibly this could be an entity which is caused due to the uh, biting uh, forces or because of the biting in this area or traumatic bite, which would have caused uh, a blockage or which could have probably caused the injury to the ductal epithelium and there is spillage of uh, 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 the saliva and this is what is uh, a mucosal. Then finally, when we, are when we are talking about the malignant lesions of the labial mucosa, the first thing comes to mind is basal cell carcinoma. Uh, basal cell carcinoma is uh, the etiology of this is associated with uh, uh, the UV radiation from the, uh, the sun. Most commonly seen in the direct sun exposed areas, that is the, the bridge of the nose, the, the lower lip, and probably on the malar areas here and the ear. So these are the commonest sites for basal cell carcinoma. So we, we, we are going to talk about what exactly is carcinoma in the later stages. Let me just, uh, because we are talking about the lip, I just told you a malignant lesion which can be associated with the lip. Most, uh, mostly seen on the lower labial mucosa is basal cell carcinoma. Uh, uh, that is again. It is again, uh, you know, associated with people who are directly exposed to the uh, the sun. Usually, uh, in the European countries, people have the habit of uh, you know uh, going for sun baths and all those things. So this this is a basic uh, etiologic factor for a basal cell carcinoma. Fine. Uh, uh, the buccal mucosa. So uh, the lip uh, mucosa is almost like uh, the other. Uh, swellings or the other uh, changes what we see in the lip, lip mucosa is we can see an angioedema. Angioedema is uh, usually associated with some kind of allergic reactions which I'm going to show it in the later stages of the presentation and uh, we have uh, orofacial granulomatosis, chilitis glandula glandularis, all these things are possibly the lip swellings which are usually seen and sometimes associated with um, uh, other systemic conditions also. Uh, the other thing, uh, the very, very important thing, uh, which I missed it, I, 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 I sorry, I, I forgot to put a picture of that, is the racial pigmentation, which is seen on the labial mucosa. A racial pigmentation is usually a normal uh, uh, the physiological melanin pigmentation, which, which is usually seen in dark individuals. Uh, so that is again a variation of normal, we can call it as. So this is about the labial mucosa. Now coming to the buccal mucosa. Buccal mucosa, I mean, you know, it is, it is, it is amazing. Buccal mucosa, uh, it, it's just like a structure which is, you know, let me just explain you about that. So this is the normal structure of buccal mucosa. Uh, the elasticity of, elasticity of buccal mucosa is beautiful. You can stretch it and, you know, this, this structure here is again a very important structure. This is uh, what we can term it as, or what it is named as, it is a parotid papilla, that is the opening of Stenson's duct. I think, I, I think uh, sometime back, uh, we had a case discussion, hopefully if I'm not wrong, in GDP, which was posted by Dr. Salman, uh, 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 which is associated with parotid papilla, that is what we call it as. Um, the air entrapment uh, uh, within the parotid papilla, it is termed as pneumoparotid, which is usually seen in glass blowers or people uh, who, uh, musicians who use uh, flutes, all these people, they have a pneumoparotid, that is the air entrapment within the parotid papilla. Now, not necessarily that every individual will have a same 
very prominent parotid papilla sometimes it can be uh, you know flat which is not at all visible which is not at all prominent but in some cases it is too very prominent and it can be sometimes mistaken um, to some uh, you know fibromas or any uh, any other kind of benign uh, uh, buccal mucosal lesions but when we are when we are talking about uh, when we when we actually know the site of this so it becomes very easy to differentiate so it where does the parotid gland opens it opens opposite upper molar on the buccal aspect so, uh, usually uh, if we say it is at the second molar sometimes it can be slightly more further in between the first and second molar or it can uh, most probably sometimes it can be uh, to the first molar region also so this is about the parotid papilla then again four days granules can can we see this can we see this this is this is so amazing this is so beautiful can we see this dotted structures which we yellowish uh, dotted structures see basically this is a variation of normal what are these four days granules as i told you it, these are the ectopic sebaceous glands ectopic in the sense which are not supposed to be present here but we see this here or maybe to be more specific we can call it as a choristoma what is a choristoma choristoma some, is something which uh, basically is uh, normal tissue in an abnormal location for example if i can say a, the classical example for a choristoma is a cartilage which is growing on the surface of the tongue this is what we can call it as a choristoma so for these granules these are the ones yellowish small dotted nodules um, we, we, we can actually see the we can actually appreciate the granular appearance of that they are uh, you know the size varies it can be around say 1 to 2 mm in diameter various multiple numbers are you know joined together or uh, way apart it can it can slightly extend posterior slightly towards the retromolar area also but most commonly seen on the uh, buccal mucosal surface this is about the uh, they are sometimes an uh, isolated findings mm, the common locations include the labial mucosa uh the retromolar pad and sometimes usually see there's, there's always a confusion on whether these four days granules are present on the uh, attached gingiva I, i don't say no that they they absolutely they don't see on the no it is not correct we can see four days granules even on the attached gingiva but we have to be careful in in differentiating these four days granules from the other components of the gingival surface now what are the other components of the gingival surface basically we have uh, keratotic nodules on the gingival surface that is on the attached gingiva wherein small uh, nodular appearance of the keratin is seen so this is again has to be differentiated mm, uh, occur in multiple uh, multiple clusters uh, plaques or patches can also be seen so this is about four days granules uh, then the next one is linea alba now what do we know about linea alba linea alba is a linear white line exactly seen at the occlusal plane uh, if you can see here this is very mild here in this case but here it becomes slightly more prominent which is starting from the second molar region uh, almost coming towards the uh, uh, the corner of the mouth or maybe towards the canine area uh, or canine region um this is a common variation uh, uh, possibly seen in the buccal mucosa Uh, which is generally asymptomatic, one uh, to two millimeter wide, and extends horizontally from the second molar area to the canine region. Um, the lesion is always, most of the time, seen bilaterally. That is, uh, both side of the 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 buccal mucosa uh, develops in response. uh what is the reason, or why does it occur, or what why what is the etiology of this? Basically, this is against the pressure of the buccal mucosa which is applied on the uh, on the teeth or the occlusal surface so because of this this indented area or a line like structure is formed here uh we can see this is this is mildly hyperkeratotic that is ex uh, excessive formation of keratin in this area uh this this condition is often associated with um, you know patients with uh, uh, pressure bruxism clenching or suckling trauma or uh, most of the times we we can see people who have got up uh, uh you know thick 
like uh, buccal mucosal surface or what we can call it as uh, fluffy cheeks. So these kind of people usually have this. It is just a variation of normal. No treatment is actually required for this. And sometimes it so happens because of this prominence in this area, because of this elevated appearance in this area, uh, the patient might tend to bite this area uh, unknowingly. So that could be only the, uh, the possible complication which is associated with this. This is about linear alba. Then the next thing is leukodema. Leukodema is, you know, it's, 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 it's an amazing lesion. Uh, it's like uh, we, we might have heard about uh, a whitish appearance on the buccal surface or the buccal mucosal surface. Now, what is this whitish appearance? Uh, the classic feature about leukodema is uh, when you stretch the mucosal surface, it disappears. And when you just again relax the buccal surface or the mucosal surface, it reappears again. So similar to that, uh, I mean, uh, we, we can just give an example, like all of us have seen Three Idiots movie where in America, American says, uh, button the baya, light on. You stretch the mu oral mucosa, the color disappears. You leave the oral mucosa, again the color reappears again. So the, if I have to tell you about the etiology of this, or if I have to tell you about the, uh, the mechanism of this, this is caused because of extracellular accumulation of fluid in the epithelial surface. Now, epithelial cells are attached to each other with desmosomal and hemidesmosomal junctions. So when we have a break in this desmosomal and hemidesmosomal junctions, it is called term or it is called as acantholysis. But here in this case, we don't have any disruption or any changes in the epithelial surface. It is just the accumulation of the fluid in the extracellular surface. Now, when we correlate this, when we stretch the mucosal surface, this, this uh, uh, fluid which is accumulated, which spreads to a wider area or wider surface area. So because of that reason, the, the, the color disappears. And when we leave it again, it comes back to its normal. This is about leukodema, most commonly associated. Again, an important feature. It can be completely white like this. But when we see the same leukodema lesion in a smoker, it can have a you know, grayish appearance like this uh, similarly, which usually uh, most commonly seen in uh, smokers, chronic smokers, basically. This is about leukodema. Uh, then we have something which is very interesting, something which is very common. This is what we term it as morsicatio baccarum. Now, what is morsicatio baccarum? It is morsicatio, that is morsus. The, the term is derived from a Latin word. The meaning is bite. So this is what we, in, in general, we can say it is a chronic cheek bite. So we have three different types, Mosicatio baccarum, Mosicatio labiarum, and Mosicatio linguarum. So labiarum on the labial mucosa, linguarum on the tongue, Mosicatio baccarum on the buccal mucosa. So this is about Mosicatio baccarum. Now, a question arises here. When we say it is uh, because of the chronic irritation or because of the chronic, uh, you know, rubbing of the mucosal surface again the surface of the tooth so if you can see this uh, the surface area is so beautifully denuded so it is it is like you know something is peeling out of the mucosal surface so this is how it appears so but the question is here what is a fibroma then or what is a, a fibrous le a lesion that is also caused because of biting Chronic cheek biting causes a, a, a fibrous lesion. So let, let me just explain you. This is a picture of uh, uh, Mosicatio linguarum, which is seen on the lateral border of the tongue. At the same time, here is a fibroma. Now, why fibroma here? This is also caused by chronic trauma or chronic biting in that area, especially at the corners of the mouth, because the, the, the tip of the canine is very sharp and people tend to have that. Uh, usually in teenagers, when the stress level go higher, the, the habit of biting starts are usually not necessarily most commonly seen in teenagers, not necessarily. It can be seen in the elderly patients. Now, let me just tell you what about a fibroma. See, basically, it depends on how deep is the bite. If it is confined only to the epithelial surface, it is just abrading the mucosal surface here. But as the deep, go, uh, as the bite goes deeper, which is uh, involving the connective tissue component, it becomes more fibrous and it, get, it, it, get, it gets fibrous and this is how it gives rise to a, a fibroma. This is basically the depth of the bite which is important here. So this is about 
three different aspects that is Moschiaccio Baccarum, Moschiaccio Libiarum, and Moschiaccio Linguarum. So most of the times, let, let me just tell you one more thing here. Uh, people have the habit of uh, having hot drinks, hot drinks in the sense, which is very hot, like for example, coffee or hot tea or hot water. Sometimes you have a similar appearance on the label mucosa that is similar to that of Mosicacia libiarum, uh, but it, it vanishes within some time as soon as because the the healing capacity of a mucosa is amazing. It's, it's, a, it's very fast. So that could be one change which we see in the Mosicacia libiarum. So this is about uh, uh, the Mosicacia baccarum, libiarum, linguarum. And uh, at the same time, I have explained to you about fibroma. Fibroma, the consistency of the fibroma is thicker. When we try palpating this lesion, we can see a nodule-like appearance or maybe a rubbery uh, consistency probably we can say. So this is about that. So then the next one is, um, no, no, we are shifting uh, slightly towards the lesions. So uh, keratosis, what is keratosis? Keratosis, okay, let's see what is keratin. Keratin is a protein which is seen on the mucosa or the cells of the mucosa. So when we say cigarette keratosis, if a person has the habit of keeping the cigarette, especially in one single area, and uh, to be more specific, I can say a filterless cigarette, which produces more amount of heat, which gives a variation. Can you see this? This slight area is pigmented here. So this could be possibly because of uh, uh, the nicotine absorbing in that area. And here, this is about the, the, uh, the whitish appearance here. What we can see, this is about the keratinization happening in that area or it is keratinized. So this is about cigarette keratosis. And then, <clears throat> so we'll, we'll continue with uh, uh, keratosis furthermore. Uh, now this traumatic white lesions probably, when we are talking about this kind of keratinization, not necessarily it is always uh, uh, associated only with cigarettes, but we have many other components like for example, frictional keratosis, usually seen and uh, even uh, a continuous biting on the buccal mucosa can give rise to uh, a keratinized area in that surface. Now here, this is what we can uh, uh, see. This, this is a classic of keratinization in this area. If you can see this, this is basically, can we see this uh, changes which are, uh, see this is a normal mucosa which is completely smooth and the pinkish or quite probably light pinkish in color, but at the same time, can we see here, it is completely whitish. And one more thing, let me highlight you here, the basic color of any oral mucosal uh, pathologies depend on the degree of keratinization. The more the keratinization, the whiter the lesion, the less the keratinization, the less whitish the lesion is, or it is because it is exposing the underlying tissue, so it becomes more reddish. So this is about keratinization. Now this is uh, basically about, um, Mm, uh, the, the keratinization. So similar lesion or similar uh, uh, presentation is seen in uh, what we call it as tobacco pouch keratosis. People have the habit of keeping uh, tobacco quid, which is mixed with lime or betel net in the vestibule, probably in the posterior, posterior vestibule here. And sometimes people have the habit of keeping in the upper labial mucosa, just stuffing it here and in the lower labial mucosa. So continuous uh, friction or continuous irritation to the mucosal surface will change the surface of the mucosal layer, will change or will transform the normal mucosa into a, a keratinized mucosa. So this is about keratinized mucosa. Uh, let me just tell you about this. This is maybe it looks similar as if it is keratinized, but it is uh, a more specific to be it is a, a white spongy nevus. It is a, a inherited condition or maybe probably present from birth, or it could be acquired in the later stages of um, uh, life, which is characterized by the appearance of asymptomatic, uh, painless, there's no pain at all, white, uh, completely white. Uh, again, again, uh, here, let me, let me highlight it. This, is, this whiteness is not because of the keratinization, because the color of the nevus itself is white. 
white folded spongy plaques so we can see this uh, sponge like plaques which are which which is almost spread to a wider surface area of the epithelium uh, the, the lesion often exhibits a symmetric uh, wavy pattern the, the 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 surface of the epithelium has got a wavy pattern the, so um, most commonly seen on the buccal mucosa not necessarily the other parts are free it can be seen on the gingiva or the alveolar mucosa or the alveolar ridges um, involved or sometimes in extensive cases it can involve the uh, the entire oral cavity covering the soft palate hard palate all these areas and next thing is this is one more very important thing this is uh, a lesion which is representing an aspirin burn so possibly aspirin is uh, taken to relieve the pain wherein the topical aspirin agents are given so that might cause a reaction and create a, a burn like surface here or maybe uh, an injury so the similar appearance we will have when we have a, uh, when we usually have a thermal burn uh, so this is uh, we have the similar appearance now this is what is important to us this is what is very uh, you know we need to have an idea about this so this is a classical picture of leukoplakia all of us know uh, might have heard about leukoplakia what is leukoplakia and what is the importance of this why is it threatening or why it is annoying us or why it is important to us so let's let's talk about that leukoplakia the name itself suggests leuco is white plakia is patch so white patch which can be characterized and clinically differentiated from other possible white lesions so it is a non scrapable lesion because uh, it is coming from within the epithelium i mean uh, when we just go back to the first slide where I uh, explained you about the epithelium, I'm, I'm just further going to say, uh, talk about that uh, furthermore. So this is about leukoplakia. We'll, we'll see the different stages. This is completely a clinical entity. Leukoplakia is completely a clinical entity and the, the, the diagnosis is completely based on the clinical scenario. Now, if you can see here, uh, the white whitish appearance of this lesion it's it's in the the floor of the mouth to a certain extent then on the tongue area here so this is about leukoplakia so it starts from something like this if you can just see the the mucosal surface is slightly getting altered you can see the wavy uh, 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 the lines which are uh, starting and and at the same time we can see the color of this lesion is slightly changing here it is slightly becoming more whiter further progresses it becomes like this so much corrugated the surface epithelium has lost its uh, uh, smoothness it lost its color and if you can appreciate this this could be say clinically this is what is important if you can see the color here it is slightly brownish if you can see the color here this is slightly whitish why this could be possibly because of the the accumulation of these or the the, the the products which are released by the tobacco which are kept in that area are absorbed in this oral mucosal surface and which has changed the color so this is about uh, this is a thin uh, surface uh, in the initial stages it appears like this then again the the later stages it goes on uh, we have different types uh, or we can uh, say uh, we have different types of the mucosal um, changes taking place. Uh, so this leukoplakia we can actually uh, we can also call as a protective reaction against chronic irritation, which can be either by tobacco, which can be either by alcohol or some uh, fungal uh, f some infections like um, syphilis, or possibly because of some fungal infection most commonly occurring fungal infection in the oral cavity would be candidiasis we'll be talking about candidiasis in the uh, later slides and possibly it can be due to chronic friction in that area and uh, sometimes uh, vitamin deficiencies also can give rise to this and sometimes galvanism can also uh, give rise to these kind of um, lesions so this is about um, leukoplakia so we have different types or different forms of uh, leukoplakias we have homogeneous non homogeneous so this is again can we see this is this is again a classic homogeneous uh, a pattern of the leukoplakia which is actually seen here on the this is the base of the tongue and this is on the corner of the mouth or the buccal mucosa and this is again on the alveolar mucosa 
so this is a mild form. This is uh, extensive form of eucoplakia or extensive lesion, which is almost spreading on the buccal mucosa on the on the vestibule and the gingival surface. So these are the severe forms with the, the same picture which I have shown. Look at the color of this. Look at the color difference. Possibly it is it is not as white as this appears. This is more whitish. That means it, it, it shows that the amount of keratinization is higher or the amount of keratinization is more here. So this is uh, furthermore uh, a pattern of uh, leukoplakia which changes itself. If we can see here, it has got a verrucous surface or uneven uh, groove pattern surface, what we can call it as. This is a verrucous form of leukoplakia. So no, not necessarily uh, a person has got leukoplakia in one side of the oral cavity. Uh, the other sites are also should be affected by leukoplakia. A person can have uh, uh, different lesions on different parts of the oral cavity. So this is a combination what I wanted to show. It's like, see, this is not leukoplakia. So this is, we, we are going to talk about this in the later stages. This is a classic picture of lichen planus. In the same patient, we have lichen planus on the buccal mucosa and at the same time, leukoplakic lesion on the tongue surface. So this is a combination which can be seen. Okay, uh, this picture, forget about what is written here, looks pretty complicated. Don't worry about, uh, just see the picture here. Normal mucosa, the surface here and the, the epithelium. The surface here, the epithelium. So just come to a little more further, thin smoothly. This, the surface is losing its consistency here. So if you can see, this, the surface is losing its consistency. And the epithelium, there are slight alterations of uh, epithelium taking place. I spoke about acantholysis. I did not tell you what is acanthosis. Acanthosis is... Uh, Basically, when we when we talk about the different layers of the cell, that is, we have spoken about uh, stratum basal, stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum. So one specific layer increases its thickness. So this is what we term as acanthosis. So this is thin, smooth leukoplakia, which there is slight changes here. And fissured leukoplakia, the surface is completely getting fissured here. We can see the surface and we can see some cellular activity happening here. Now, what is the cellular activity happening in the uh, leukoplakia? This is uh, the, the cells are getting converted itself into dysplastic cells. What is dysplastic cells? These are changing its morphology, changing its structure, changing its size. And the nucleus within the cell is changing its color. And the chromatin, the amount of chromatin within the nucleus is, is becoming more and more. So this is the the dysplastic cells which are slightly seen in thick visual leukoplakia then furthermore it progresses into a verruciform leukoplakia can you see the surfaces we have elevations we have depressions and it is completely becoming whitish so that means the amount of keratin is increasing in this area the keratin layer is getting deposited and the keratin amount of keratin is increasing in this area. So this is about a verruciform. Then furthermore, the dysplastic activity of the cells here is becoming more and more. That is the number of dysplastic cells are increasing and the keratin is getting disappeared in this and it is giving a reddish appearance. This is what we can term it as erythroplakia. So the keratin is getting vanished from the surface and it is giving rise to a reddish surface, which we can term it as erythroplakia. So this is about the variation. Normal mucosa, it, it gets transformed into a thin, smooth leukoplakia. Then it goes to a thick, fissured leukoplakia. Then it takes up the uh, appearance of a granular or verruciform. Then it further gets converted into erythroplakia. Now, base, see, as I told you, this is a clinical entity. Leukoplakia is completely a clinical entity. When we talk about uh, the histopathological entity, we talk about the dysplastic features which are seen in the cellular surface. So we term it as mild, moderate, severe, and then finally carcinoma in situ. That is the amount of dysplastic cells on what layer the dysplastic cells are present. If it is only in the basement membrane or in the basal layer, we term it as mild. If it slightly goes towards the middle layer, we term it as moderate. Then we, uh, when it almost comes to the superficial layer, uh, we call it as severe. 
but when the dysplastic cells are seen in the entire thickness of the epithelium, we term it as carcinoma in situ. So this is about leukoplakia. Let me just continue how this progresses onto a carcinoma or a cancer. See, when we, when we talk about the basement membrane here, this is the one which is, so the, the cells, what we see here, the black color cells, these are the inflammatory cells. These are not the epithelial cells. So the cells which are seen here, which are seen in the epithelial surface completely. So what happens if it further progresses this basement membrane, which is acting as a barrier from the cells to penetrate deep into the connective tissue. When this basement membrane breaks up, the epithelial cells penetrate deep into the connective tissue, forming epithelial islands. So these cells start producing keratin in the, uh, uh, in the connective tissue component. That is how it is progressed into uh, uh, the carcinoma. So we have epithelial islands in the connective tissue and we have keratin depositions in the connective tissue. That is how it is progressed to a carcinoma. Hope this picture is clear. Uh, I know it is quite difficult to you know follow or uh, understand this, but uh, uh, as much as possible, I've tried making it very simple. So hopefully, let's let's go on. So lichen planus, lichen planus. What do I tell you about lichen planus? Uh, amazing, beautiful lesion. Uh, can can we just appreciate uh, as we as we see? Uh, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever tried any practitioner for that matter? Have you ever tried? Uh, observing a lesion using a magnifying glass or probably a, uh, a loops which you we usually look at look at look at uh, the lesion using these magnifying glasses or loops you'll completely have a different picture about this lesions lichen planus look at this this is a reticular pattern where it, it completely looks like radiating lines which are you know on the buccal mucosal surface and uh, similarly here also these are the radiating lines but uh, we see uh, they are they confined they are close to each other. So this is what is about um, lichen planus. To be more specific, uh, what can I tell you about lichen planus? It is a uh, uh, inflammatory um, condition, autoimmune inflammatory condition. What I can tell you, uh, most commonly seen in uh, female patients. Why most commonly seen in female patients? Uh, there are a lot of theories put forward for this, uh, but mm, not very much convincing. Uh, but to be more specific, uh, let's tell you about um, more about lichen planus. What happens here is um, lichen planus, um, well, to begin with, it has a very important role and it is most of the times associated with stress. Uh, I happen to have a case which I'm still, you know, uh, monitoring or uh, still under follow-up. Uh, uh, mm, this case, the stress levels, as soon as the stress level of this lady increases, the, uh, the lesional tissue becomes more prominent. Uh, it is something which is very unique. It is something which is, uh, you know, which is very unique. So, as soon as the stress level comes down, the, the lesional tissue uh, becomes mild or the appearance of this area becomes mild. So the other important feature here is what we can call it as uh, Wickham striae. Uh, so these radiating lines or what we can call it as, uh, uh, or what we can term it as Wickham striae. So why is it Wickham striae? It is named after uh, a, a French scientist, Louis Frederick Wickham. Uh, so this is because he is the one who named this. This is the classical sign of uh, lichen planus, most commonly seen in uh, females associated with stress. Always remember associated with stress. You can, you can actually look, uh, if you have any cases which you're following up in your own clinics, you can see as the stress level increases, the lesion becomes more prominent. As the stress level comes down, the lesion automatically starts fading up or vanishing. So this is about lichen planus. Uh, then further, let's pro proceed to the uh, tongue. So tongue, it is it is a beautiful structure in the oral cavity, what I can tell you. A uh, lot of things to talk about tongue, but uh, here we are going to just see about some uh, 
conditions or the variations of normal basically uh, three different components or three different parts that is the dorsum the ventral aspect and the lateral borders so this is the normal dorsum of the tongue uh, which is the anterior one third uh, if you can see here at the at the lateral borders so we can see some scalloping or maybe the tongue is getting adapted to the teeth so this is what we term it as scalloped or crenated appearance of a tongue so this is the dorsal aspect again the posterior to that so can we see the the beauty of this this is a circumvallate papillae so it is arranged in v shape at the posterior two third so the importance of this is just behind this circumvallate papillae we have something called as a foramen cecum uh, that is a, a, a foramina so this is again the ventral aspect so can we see this what are these these are uh, the name of this is plica fimbriata uh this is the tissue extensions what we can see here and which is slightly pigmented so these are the melanin pigmentations so these are brown so what is the importance of this these uh, in general we can say these are only the tissue extensions or the tissue tags so this is about the uh, plica fimbriata which is seen in the uh, the uh, ventral aspect of the tongue then again uh, the lateral borders so this is the ventral aspect so it has to be interchanged this is the lateral border and this is the ventral aspect the commonest uh, variation of normal what we see in the ventral aspect is about uh, uh, the varicosities so uh, this is again a uh, uh, mistake most of the times mistaken for a lesion on the lateral aspect of the tongue this is a foliate papillae so the papillae of the tongue all of us are aware of i told you about the circumvallate papillae this is a foliate papillae then we have filiform and fusiform fungiform papillae so this is lingual thyroid uh, sorry the lingual tonsil what is a lingual tonsil it is nothing but the lymphoid tissue which is seen on the lateral borders of the tongue so this is about the tongue um am i am i taking uh, more time or should i cut it short or is it okay if i go on with the same pace uh, how many more you do you have if you don't mind how long do you need or uh, maybe uh, uh, we are in the tongue then then the further comes the floor of the mouth and then the the pigmented lesions maybe another uh, say 10 to 15 minutes or if you want to just you know uh, go a little faster i'll try to go a little faster I think you're okay. I think 10-15 minutes is fine. You can. Okay, fine. So this is about the lingual tonsil, which I was talking about, and uh, this is again the plica fimbriata. The importance of this is plica fimbriata shows some amount of uh, taste buds in the young individuals or young, uh, or in fact, possibly in the younger children. So this is about the importance of that, and then we have uh, fissure tongue. basically fissured tongue is again a variation of normal the fissures can be uh, of different various patterns that is one single fissure in exactly at the center of the tongue or probably it can be uh, having branches uh, like something like this so the the, the main uh, thing which has to be concentrated here is keeping this areas clean so it is uh, when it is fissure it is it is very uh, important that the person keeps it cleaning very often or else what happens the, the food gets accumulated there and the bacterial growth starts in that area and then probably a uh, patient might have bad breath or probably a stained tongue or a coated tongue in that area so this is one important feature of a fissured tongue so these are the varicosities so what are these varicosities these are enlarged dilated veins on the ventral surface of the tongue which is A common finding in the elderly people uh, more very less seen in the younger individuals but not necessarily it has to, it has to be it can be uh, the etiology of this is this is uh, because of the blockage of the veins uh, probably because of uh, some foreign body or any uh, atherosclerotic plaques or um, um, the loss of elasticity of uh, elasticity of the uh, the capillaries so this is one variation of normal so the next one this is again a very classic picture of a geographic tongue what is a geographic tongue this is a benign inflammatory condition which is characterized by irregular patches on the dorsal aspect of the tongue so why do we call it as geographic because it keeps changing the shape of this the lesional tissue it keeps changing or maybe it can be uh, referred to as the the world map or the geography of the the world map so it it basically keeps changing so um, 
the irregular pattern or patches on the surface give a, a map like appearance or prob probably we can see a, a world map that thus it is termed as geographic. Uh, it occurs about 1% of the population. Mm, women and young adults are most commonly seen. Mm, stressful conditions, it is associated with nutritional deficiencies, hormonal deficiencies, sometimes seen in hereditary conditions also, uh, possibly. Mm, and uh, no treatment is actually required for this. Uh, some cases it appears and it disappears. It appears and it disappears. So this is again what I told about uh, the ge uh, geographic tongue. And this picture shows some uh, the scalloping of the tongue. See, we if we can try correlating this, there is a gap between these teeth and there, there are some kind of indentations on the surface of this tongue. So when a person tries to push his tongue against this. So the, the, uh, the tongue gains this kind of uh, appearance. So this is what we call it as scalloped or probably we can say it is uh, um, a crenated appearance of the tongue. Now uh, this geographic tongue basically, uh, let me add one more point here. Basically it has got three patterns. So the first one are the patchy areas of desquamated filiform papillae. So then the next one is uh, which are slightly raised. I mean, the, the we can we can see some kind of uh, you know if you can see this area, this is slightly raised from the uh, surface of the tongue. So this is again one more pattern. Um, and and the other one is these patchy areas could be because of desquamated filiform papillae, uh, which is you know surrounded by an erythematous border. Here we don't see any kind of erythematous borders, but these are three different patterns what we see. So next other is a median rhomboid glass glossitis. This is again earlier stages or the earlier theories. It was believed to it was believed to be a developmental defect uh, because uh, because it usually uh, believed to be a cause of incomplete descent of the tuberculum empire during the development period. So later on, uh, due to many new researchers and many new you know, uh, ideologies. Uh, now it is associated with um, most commonly, most commonly with uh, candidal infections. So um, the most common location is the midline. That is the uh, the dorsum of the tongue here. This is the area. Uh, this is where we see median rhomboid glossitis. And the next one is this is a ball tongue. Ball tongue is completely flat. It is like a smooth surface. We don't see any kind or maybe we can call it as this area is devoid of the papillae possibly. This is seen associated with some of the systemic conditions. Most commonly the, the ball tongue or a flat surface of the tongue is seen in iron deficiency anemias. Okay, next one, hairy tongue. Um, well, it is the picture looks quite squeak, scary, but uh, it is very interesting to know what is the reason for this hairy tongue. So we know that the surface of the tongue is covered by uh, the papillae. So this is a mild form of hairy tongue, and this is a severe form. So don't don't be under the impression that the uh, the pigmented areas or the color is because of this. So this color could be possibly because of the uh, uh, the, the food products or the bacterial endotoxins which are being you know uh, emitted in that area. So abnormal elongation. How is it caused? It is because of the abnormal elongation of the filiform papillae on the dorsum surface of the tongue that gives a hair-like appearance to the tongue. Um, possibly it could be sometimes hyperkeratotic that is keratin, uh, keratin production can be seen in this um, regions and mostly associated with patients uh, smokers and uh, other uh, symptomatic lesions like uh, fungal lesions like candida uh, infections. Okay then we have atrophy, hypertrophy. Atrophy, what do you understand by atrophy? Atrophy is a progressive degeneration of a cell or an organ or a tissue wherein <clears throat> the, the cell starts shrinking. So if you can see this, this is the normal tongue and here it is atrophic. This is a case which you have picked up, uh, you know, a uh, patient who had got a stroke uh, or a stroke patient wherein one side was completely affected, even the tongue is showing the similar features or the atrophy. Uh, this is hypertrophy, that is hypertrophy here, this is the increase in size of the cells without any increase in number of the cells. This is what we term it as hypertrophy. 
so uh, without cell division so this is usually seen in uh, excessive muscular activity people who use uh, or possibly it could be a feature of um, praxism also in certain cases uh, when excessive muscular activity is seen or uh, the, uh, the possibly there could be hypertrophy of uh, certain tissues uh, the next one very important very important a lingual thyroid what is a lingual thyroid <clears throat> It is nothing but a, a thyroid tissue which is seen on the posterior aspect of the tongue. What is the importance of this? Lingual thyroid is very, very important to us. When we see any kind of nodular appearance on the posterior aspect of the tongue, that is just below. I, I, I showed you a picture of circumvalid papillae. Just below the circumvalid papillae, there's something called a foramen cecum. What is the importance of this foramen cecum? Here comes the importance because the thyroid gland develops from this area and descends downwards and gets situated in the neck area here. Sometimes it so happens if there is any developmental disturbance which are associated with the thyroid gland. So this lingual thyroid could possibly only the thyroid tissue in the whole body. So because of that, we have to be very careful when we are tackling about lingual thyroid. The first thing when you see a nodular appearance, which is seen, and if you confirm that this is a lingual thyroid, always refer to the patient for a thyroid scan and get to know whether the thyroid gland is present in that area or the patient has some other uh, thyroid tissue within the whole body. So this is about the lingual thyroid. Oh, I'm sorry about this slide. So um, this is about candidiasis. Now we are talking about candidiasis. The main difference about candidiasis and leukoplakia, let me tell you here, candidiasis is something which is external, which is from outside. Leukoplakia is something which is from inside. The candidiasis is caused by the, the candida albicans. We have different species of candidias, uh, candida. Uh, we have candida albicans. We have candida parapsilosis. We have candida cruisi. We have candida glabrata. So all these are the different species of candidiasis which are seen, but most commonly, most commonly associated with candidiasis or the candida albicans. Now, what is the importance of this and how do we differentiate? Candidiasis is an opportunistic infection. It, it needs to get an opportunity to start the infection. So as soon as the, the immune status of the person goes down, or if there is any kind of change in the oral cavity, possibly it could be because of some physical uh, restraints or possibly it could be uh, because of uh, the intraoral structures. It, it gets an opportunity, it starts infecting. So the main difference is candida is scrapable, leukoplakia is non-scrapable. <clears throat> The best thing to diagnose candidiasis is a, a, a smear usually. Uh, uh, it, is, it is not very uncommon to take a smear. Uh, what we'll have to do is just take ice cream stick, swipe it on the, on the lesional tissue, put it on that on the glass lab. And usually uh, most of the labs do a, a smear for the fungal infection. That is uh, even the medical labs, they, they are used to it because they used to usually do with uh, uh, vaginal smears basically, which is, you know, uh, again to see or rule out fungal uh, infections. So this is basically about candidiasis. Now this picture, especially if we can try observing this picture, uh, uh, see, this is a lesion which is uh, a classic of a squamous cell carcinoma. And then this is a superimposed candidal infection, which is seen here. So candidal infection can be sometimes superimposed also. That is underlying there is an epithelial pathology and above that we might have a candidal infection. So the only thing which we can try and differentiate is candidiasis is scrapable, leukoplakia and other white lesions are non-scrapable. Then ulcer, Ulcer, all of us know, uh, if I have to tell you a definition of the ulcer, it is basically a discontinuity or break in the epithelial surface. So uh, exposing the underlying tissue. So this is about an ulcer. So, and uh, we can see the borders of the ulcer here and uh, mm, reddish area. Most of the times what happens is there's some amount of granulation tissue covering this area. So, uh, the, or maybe we can call it as a slough like structure, which is covering this area. This is a normal ulcer, which is a Carter like lesion on the skin or the oral mucosa. 
ulcer and squamous cell carcinoma. Sometimes even squamous cell carcinoma also might show a small ulcer like appearance like this. So to differentiate this history becomes very important. History is it's, it's very important in most of the uh, diagnostic lesions or any lesions for that matter. So history as well as the duration of the lesions, any oral lesions, which is probably, uh, you know, present in the oral cavity uh, for more than three weeks um, without any external factor or without any source of irritation in that area or without any previous history of any other, like for example, optus ulcer, traumatic ulcer. So that needs or that calls for a biopsy that is more than three weeks. Again, frictional keratosis, I have spoken about this previously also. So frictional keratosis, this is, see, this is a retromolar area wherein the upper molar is impinging on this area. So continuous friction to that area is caused keratinizing, uh, keratinization in this area. Not necessarily that the tooth should directly sit on the mucosal surface or the tooth should directly abrade on the mucosal surface. Even sometimes it so happens that the food products which gets accumulated in this area during chewing, the food products are getting rubbed against this, that is creating friction and that is causing keratinization here. So this is a classic example for continuous tooth brush trauma. So if you can see the spread of this, the complete white area, this is completely keratinized. So this is about uh, frictional keratosis, which is seen on the alveolar mucosa here. This is again on the at the retromolar area. So floor of the mouth, uh, let me not go very deep into floor of the mouth. The structures, what we can see here, this is the, um, the lingual foramen. The importance of this is, if you can see this area, we have two small openings near this. This is what we term it as a lingual caruncle. So the importance of this lingual caruncle is the, the, the gland or the, the duct of the submandibular salivary gland that is the Wharton's duct which opens here in this area. This is the lingual caruncle. The most common lesions what we see in the floor of the mouth is a ranula or possibly a cyanolith and then possibly usually what happens uh, most of the times it is uh, mistaken or it is probably you know uh, confused with other pathologies. When we have to see the floor of the mouth. We need to tell the patient to raise his tongue upwards. So what happens? The, 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 floor, the mucosa on the floor of the mouth, it stretches. So what we can call it as a lingual folds on both the surface that gives an appearance as if it is a swelling. So a bidigital palpation would help you uh, rule out uh, the pathology of that. So if you can keep a finger within inside and a hand below it and try to palpate it on the, all the surfaces of the, uh, the floor of the mouth, we tend to get an idea about the structures. What we see here uh, in the anterior aspect here, we see the sublingual salivary gland. In the posterior aspect here, we see the submandibular salivary gland just below the mylohyoid ridge that is in the mandibular uh, that is uh, just below the mylohyoid bridge. So this is about the floor of the mouth. And then coming to the palatal okay. aspect. Yes, sir. We have overshot by about 15 minutes. Uh, maybe another five minutes, sir. I'll just sure. brush it up. Okay. Sure. So this is the palate. Palate, I would like to show. This is a variation of normal. This is a bony exostosis. So pal or in general, we call it as a palatal tori. The same thing we see in the mandibular aspect, we call it as a mandibular tori. So this is a normal variation. So this is again, very important, very interesting, very, uh, very, uh, not very common. So this is what we call it as nicotinic stomatitis. The classical appearance of this lesion is the, uh, the inflammation of the minor salivary glands because of the heat which is produced by the, the smoke most commonly seen in reverse smokers. The classic appearance of this. So can you see this dot like surfaces here? These are the openings of the minor salivary glands which are inflamed because of the heat which is produced by the cigarettes. So this is one thing which is seen in the, uh, the hard palate area or possibly in the juncture of the hard palate and the soft palate area. So this is nicotinic stomatitis. And the other thing which is very important that is what we can term it as petechiae. So petechiae, these are small, uh, you know, uh, extravasation of blood, which is seen in most of the infection. And sometimes it can be associated with uh, certain drugs also, possibly due to uh, malarial drugs or um, some amount of infections like, um, you know, uh, many infections. 
So this is about the petechiae. Uh, the other feature of this petechiae is it vanishes on its own. No treatment is actually required for this. No treatment is actually required for this. And um, what is the other thing which I have to tell you? Yeah, uh, other important thing about this, it can be seen in chronic CO, COPD patients, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder patients. So what happens is because of frequent coughing, so because of the frequent cough, this area might show the presence of petechiae. So this is about the soft palate and the oropharynx, the structures, what we see in the oropharynx, so the uvula, the posterior pharyngeal wall and the tonsils at the sides here. This is, you know, enlarged tonsil, which we can see uh, inflamed erythematous reddish in area, uh, which is a classic example of tonsillitis. So this is again a very rare entity. What we see here is a bifid evula. That is the evula has got two ends. So one is here. This is the mild form of bi bifid evula here. And this is what we can see here is uh, uh, the severe form. Uh, there is an opening here, but when we see here, one is this one and the other one is this one. So this is about a bifid evula. And um, Jinjaiwa, if you have to talk, uh, let me just explain you the marginal Jinjaiwa, the attached Jinjaiwa, the mucogingival junction. So with the variations of normal, what we see here. So usually when we see a whitish appearance on the gingival surface, the only thing what we are supposed to do is take a sterile piece of gauze and try to wipe it out. That gives us the difference between whether it is actually white or it is the materia alba, which is getting accumulated on the gingival surface. If you can see here, this is the, the marginal Jinjaiwa, which is slightly erythematous and inflamed in this area. So the last one, let me just uh, give you a brief idea about the pigmented lesions. This is the normal physiological pigmentation or the racial pigmentation, what we see here completely on the attached gingiva, usually seen in dark skin individuals. And this is a lesion of amalgam tattoo, which has been discussed many a times in, in the forum. So this is about the amalgam tattoo. So if you can see, uh, a grayish or a, a grayish appearance exactly at the marginal gingiva. Probably uh, the reason behind this could be this is a, a root canal treated tooth or possibly I don't have a radiograph to say it is a root canal treated tooth or probably it might have an amalgam restoration which uh, has you know given rise to this uh, amalgam tattoo. So the next one is the very important one that is smokers melanosis. So it is very difficult to differentiate between smokers melanosis and racial pigmentation in the very initial stages. This is a straightforward case which is showing you know a lot of pigmented areas on this area here and uh, uh, very bad oral hygiene and a lot of you know plaque calculus accumulation here and this is on the buccal mucosa. So the only way we can differentiate between racial pigmentation and smoker melanosis in the mild stages is the history of the patient. So if the patient gives a history, the intensity, the duration and number of cigarettes he smoked, we can try to analyze. But at the same time, the speciality about smoker melanosis is as soon as the person stops smoking, the lesion automatically uh, starts fading on its own. This is about smoker's melanosis. Then this is a macule. A uh, small confined area of epidermis on the mucosa, which is distinguished by its own color. So this is on the labial uh, lip here, and this is on the palatal surface. So this is again a nevus. Nevus and macule, the main difference is this is completely flat. So here, when we can see, this is slightly more elevated. We have different types of nevus. We have junctional nevus, we have compound nevus, we have blue nevus, different varieties of nevus. And the next very important thing about is a palatal pigmented lesion is always scary, is always, uh, we have to give extra care to that because it could possibly be a melanoma. Now, how do we differentiate about a melanoma? A, B, C, D, E. We remember airway breathing circulation. Here it is not airway breathing circulation, but two more alphabets are added. That is D and E. A is for asymmetry. B is border. C is for color. D is for diameter. E is for evolution of the lesion. A, asymmetry. The, the lesion is completely asymmetric. Borders, irregular borders. Color is brownish. Not necessarily brownish in all the whole lesion. It can be light brown in one corner, dark brown in other, other corner. Uh, diameter, more than six millimeter of uh, lesion can be a melanoma. E is evolution of the lesion. So from a flat, uh, completely flat 
lesion it can become a growth like or a nodular lesion so this is about melanoma so the, the two other things which i would like to tell you here angioedema and air emphysema which uh, most of the time so this is uh, angioedema which is usually caused due to latex allergy can we see the difference here and air emphysema uh, most of the times uh, due to surgical procedures impactions or flap surgeries where the air uh, gets entrapped in the uh, uh, the tissues and which gives rise to a uh, swelling so these are my references uh, thank you very much thank you dr sadik that was wonderful very intriguing and very educative wish, wish i would have had some more time uh, let <laughs> me see inshallah hopefully inshallah, <laughs> inshallah. Yeah. We, we we would love to hear you again uh, unfortunately i think we have overshot our time yes. today yes sorry sorry but, sorry uh, for that sorry for that no that's absolutely fine i'm going to request dr firdos nair firdos to come in for the panel talk let me just uh, unmute him assalamu alaikum dr firdos wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh right so i am still go not going to start my video i'll let you guys to t uh, take on the questions from our viewers um would it be possible to stop sharing your screen please uh, dr sadiq yes i did fabulous yeah. so yes it's all yours it's all uh, both of you can start please uh, right. th uh, thank you very much i would request uh, dr amirun nisa to join the panel please dr amirun nisa oh yes sorry i forgot just a moment please uh firstly uh, thank yeah. you dr salman sadiq uh, for this elaborate view of the world we know as the oral cavity uh the normal the variations and uh, the lesions uh, were definitely what is what uh, is needed uh, in the present day uh, to be known you know for a day to day practice uh, which would help us to identify treat and manage the patients better and uh, do we have dr ramidhan san panel please yeah yeah sure assalam alaikum dr sir waalaikum assalam ma'am we cannot see yeah my i don't know there's some problem with my video i think I yeah uh, we sure. have with us a very senior uh, clinician and practitioner a master in oral medicine with special interest in uh, rotary endodontics and implantology we are very uh, glad to have you uh, ma'am and uh, to be on the panel for so further clarity thank you jazakallah thank you uh, and queries asked by the participants uh, ma'am uh, can you start with the questions please yeah uh, the first question is uh, asked by dr ahad he wants to know what is the difference between keratosis and uh, normal keratinized tissue Ma'am, either of you, either you or uh, Dr. Salman Sidi can take this. I think more. I think Salman can answer this more better with the pathological part of it. Difference between the keratosis and normal keratinized tissues. So I think it is mainly the uh, appearance of the tissue. Normal keratinized tissue, you can see the pinkish because keratosis uh, keratosis is more commonly with the white lesion, appearance of white lesion, and there is some his. Uh, uh the etiology of it some uh, there's some irritation to the tissue which causes the keratosis whereas normal keratinized tissue you don't have any uh, lesions or any lag appearance is different from the thing is it right uh, salman yeah, dr salman uh, let me just tell you uh, see keratinization is basically a normal process yeah okay it, 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 because it is it, it goes on like uh the, the 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 process what i have explained like desquamation the cell turnover so as soon as the cell gets to the surface even in keratinization also we have two different types of keratinization that is what we term it as from the cellular level if we see it is orthokeratinized and parakeratinized that is the presence of the nucleus in the cells and uh, absence of the nucleus in the cells now when we talk about keratinization it could be a normal phenomenon that is keratosis possibly it could be due to some kind of friction wherein more and more keratin is getting produced than normal which is giving a whitish appearance to the lesion or probably which is changing the color of the lesion than the normal mucosal color to a whitish lesion or whitish color uh dr salman uh, is it uh, the color difference is what uh, makes a difference in the keratosis and the keratinized tissue or the cellular level the color difference basically cellular level is it is a normal okay. phenomena where okay. in the cell cell comes clinical you mean to say clinically there is a, a evident color, color difference in keratosis and keratinized tissue yes exactly yes 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is uh, from Dr. Ali Mubarak, and uh, he wants to know what are the chances of leukoplakia turning malignant. See, uh, here if I have to tell you, uh, there are something called as uh, precancerous lesions and precancerous conditions. Now, what are these precancerous lesions and why do we call this as precancerous lesions? The leukoplakia is, uh, it basically starts because of some kind of habits. Like for example, smoking and uh, possibly alcohol, any kind of chronic irritation to that area continuously for a longer period of time. Uh, <clears throat> due to this. So leukoplakia, when this habits are discontinued, probably the, the tissue surface might revert back to normal or the keratinization and can back, come back to its normal. So leukoplakia is considered as a precancerous lesions or it is not a condition, it is a lesion. So probably leukoplakia, if not diagnosed in the early stages, uh, the conversion of malignancy or uh, proceeding towards malignancy is much higher. It is based again on the intensity and uh, different types of habits. I know. I, it is almost said that it is the chances of leukopakia turning malignancies around 2%. So if the habits are discontinued, I think leukopakia will not, will not, the potential, the malignant potential of leukopakia will be less. And as he said, uh, or any red and white lesions turning malignant and most com uh, the red and white lesions, the, uh, the combined lesions are more potentially malignant. That's what it says. See, basically, when we give an example for a precancerous lesion, we can term it as leukoplakia, erythroplakia, uh, and different types of leukoplakia, like candida leukoplakia, speckle leukoplakia. So all these things are probably the, the, uh, the precancerous lesions. But when we talk about precancerous conditions, uh, we can say oral submucous fibrosis is a precancerous condition. Citropenic dysphagia is a precancerous condition. Lichen planus is a precancerous condition. Uh, these are the most common. And the less cam common precancerous condition is what we can say, uh, probably I can give an example of uh, lupus erythematosus, uh, tertiary syphilis. These are the, uh, the less common pre-malignant conditions. So as Madam told, if you want it in percentage, probably it is 2% or maybe slightly less than that also. But it, it basically depends on the habits and the intensity of the habit. Now, uh, if I have to give you an example, a person who smoked 10 cigarettes per day might have a, a lesser transformation from a leukoplakia to a, a oral squamous cell carcinoma or probably any other malignancy. At the same time, if a person smokes 20 cigarettes per day, the intensity would slightly be more higher or it can be more higher. So it, it, uh, from my point of view, it, it basically depends on the habit or the intensity of the habit. So this is how it basically goes. Uh, is the 2% uh, for a total leukoplakia cumulative or different types of leukoplakia have a different percentage for a malignancy uh, potential? Different types of leukoplakia has thin, non-homogeneous, has less malignant it's potential. Different. At, at the same time, when we go to erythroplakia, I did describe the picture. In erythroplakia, what happens? The upper keratin layers start disappearing. So it becomes red. So the lesion is converted into, we cannot call that, we cannot call erythroplakia as a white lesion. We have to term it as a red lesion. So the, uh, the malignant transformation of erythroplakia is more higher when compared to leukoplakia. Right, right. Uh, there's a follow-up question from Dr. Ali Mubarak. Uh, he, uh, he continues to ask, uh, is there the uh, malignant potential for the same uh, for the red and white lesions as in leukoplakia or uh, does it uh, vary? See, very, every individual lesion has got a different malignant potential depending upon the severity of the lesion. Like as I told you, like leukoplakia has different variants. Leukoplakia, we cannot term the whole, the complete term leukoplakia, it can be severe, it can be mild, it can be moderate. So when it goes to the severe form, the malignant transformation becomes more. When it uh, the is question, in the... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, uh, is the malignant potential compared to leukoplakia same as uh, uh, compared to the malignant potential of red and white lesions? No, it differs. It differs. It changes. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Uh, Ma'am, uh, do you want to add something to this, please? So, uh, 
I think that answers the question. The red and white lesions, if he is comparing to the other red and white lesions, uh, th so the uh, the malignant, the potential malignant potential of other lesions will be different naturally. So leukoplakia, as Sir said, it depends on the type of leukoplakia. What is there? Whether it is erythroplakia or a combination of an erythroplakia and leukoplakia, that is red and red and white lesion combinations, it has more potential for malignancy. Whereas other lesions, if he is comparing to the other lesions, red and white lesions, it is less compare. If you see it uh, with leukoplakia, comparing leukoplakia and other white lesions, it is less. I think leukoplakia is more potential in oral cavity. I could say that. Yes. Uh, Dr. Nayar, we can't hear you. Dr. Nayar is stuck. Ma'am, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. The next question is from Dr. Nadeem Ahmed. Uh, he wants to know, uh, does all patients with stress show lichen planus? And uh, there's a follow-up question to this is, if not, what factors make it vulnerable to appear? See, lichen planus is completely a separate entity. What I meant to say was, when the patient is developed lichen planus, and after developing a lichen planus, if the, the, the stress levels goes ups and down or up and down, so that varies the, uh, I mean, that changes the appearance of the lesion. So it is like a person who has got lichen planus has got a high stress level or a low stress level that might show variation in the lesion. It is not necessary that everybody who has got stress is vulnerable to have lichen planus. No. So actually, lichen planus is an autoimmune disease. It's an yes, immunological it an disease. Yes. So underlying cause of lichen planus is different. The stress is just a playing a part in it to uh, develop the lichen planus and show the uh, the uh, severity of lichen planus. So stress exactly. is another just adding point of it. So stress is basically an aggravating factor for yeah, uh, any autoimmune disease. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I can agree with you. Yeah, stress is uh, an aggravating factor for a lot of diseases. You know, a lot yes, of sir. conditions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, exactly. <clears throat> uh, the next question is from uh, Dr. Wasik Rafiq. He wants to know how do you manage lichen planus? See, but there this is question no. Is for you. Uh, yeah. For me? This question is for you, ma'am. No, no. It's okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, lichen planus actually. Uh, Normally, what I treat myself for my patients is I go for topical uh, steroids. So if it is very mild, they have just a burning sensation and they have the problem with the uh, lichen planus. Burning sensation, I just go for topical uh, steroids. That is 1% of uh, the oral uh, aura waste or uh, torbocord. I ask them to apply topically. But if it is too very severe condition where they have too much of uh, burning sensation and uh, they're not able to eat or anything and then I go for uh, this uh, systemic uh, steroids also steroids. yeah but actually lichen planus I think we better go for topical steroids is more than enough and uh, counseling is more important for them yes ma'am ma'am is there a specific dosage for the topical applications uh, sir I start them with uh, three times a daily for one week and then I go for tapering I ask them to go for tapering but topically what concentration also. Yeah, what concentration do you use? Right, it's one person. One person try uh, try amenosilon, I think. No, correct. Yeah, one person. Yeah, one person. That's oh, more okay. than enough. It it uh, subsides the uh, uh, symptoms, sir. Mm -hmm. It's mainly lichen planus. It's like more of counseling the patient. Yes. And See, basically, if, if I have to put my view on this, don't give any drugs to a patient with lichen planus. Yeah. A perfect psychological counseling to that patient will solve the problem. Yeah. I mean, like steroids, we have discussed, uh, you know, in and out about steroids. Uh, basically, yeah, oral, if it is too very severe, the burning sensation and the patient is not able to eat at all, then probably we can give a, a oral, uh, you know, a steroid application for a shorter period of time. But at the same time, psychological counseling plays a very important role. See, lichen planus is something like, you know, once it comes, we, we cannot completely cure it. We have to give a, a, a conservative mode of approach. It is not like some uh, probably a, a growth or a tumor wherein we can just do a surgical excision and finish it off and say the story is over. No. Lichen planus is something which is going to remain. Yeah. So for that, most of the times it is 
more than the drugs or more than the you know medication it is the psycho psychological counseling which plays which which actually plays a very vital role in the treatment of this so it is symptomatic yes. management basically then yes, yes exactly yes. Yes, ma'am. You want to add something to this? Yeah, that's what as uh, doctor said. Asymptomatic lichen planus. I think you just give the counselling and it's more than enough. If it is severe with burning sensation, you can go for topical steroids. Otherwise, no need of treatment as such. Okay. Uh, uh, the next question is from Doctor Ahad. Uh, he wants to know: Is geographical tongue a fungal infection? No. No. Geographic tongue is an inflammatory condition. It can be superimposed by a fungal infection. Okay. Okay. uh we have a question from dr nadeem ahmed again uh, he wants to know does more keratosis mean shift towards pathology and uh, how to analyze nevus keratosis clinically from normal to being a pathology uh, is the question clear or do you want me to ask it again yeah i i got that question was the question for me or for madam anybody anybody can take you it. can answer okay. sir <laughs> okay see basically when we talk about keratinization the degree of keratinization can give us a color variation in the lesion okay one thing and the second thing yes the more amount of keratinization means the more amount of friction is taking place in that area and the more amount of you know irritation is taking place in this area because of that reason we have more keratinization so that could probably the more amount of keratinization and of which which can give rise to uh, 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 excessive destruction in that area or the lesion can progress further okay uh, ma'am uh, is there anything you want to add no so it's uh, it's same thing no like keratinization more keratinization is like like more irritation to that place is happening so that more of keratinization is uh, happening so it is truly it is going towards the pathology itself and uh, is there a way to analyze uh, nevus keratosis clinically uh, from being normal to uh, pathology i mean i i didn't get you what exactly was this i mean uh, dr nadeem mamad wants to ask i don't know uh, he says uh, to analyze nevus keratosis is there a condition called nevus keratosis nevus keratosis it's actually it is at the time it's a inherited diseases nevus if you can say so it will be either at the birth or during the childhood or during the adolescence and it will be there there will be so, uh, some history so for it do we have a combination of nevus and keratosis nevus keratosis is there no nevus you yeah, have that yeah, sir yeah. showed the picture also i think nevus keratosis during his okay he wants to know clinically uh, how do you differentiate between uh, what is normal and what is pathology i mean i mean, I mean uh, is uh, dr nadeem talking about the white spongy nevus which i spoke about no i i i am not sure what exactly he said the, okay. how do you analyze nevus so keratosis basically clinically? if it is a white spongy nevus <clears throat> it is uh you know nevus is something <clears throat> which is it can be genetic or it could be acquired also as we are talking about a general nevus so why do we call it as white spongy nevus now here i i did mention that point when i was explaining about that white spongy nevus is not the color of the nevus is not because of keratinization here it okay. is the color of the nevus itself is white okay so that is why we term it as a white spongy nevus so this has nothing to do with the degree of keratinization here okay okay uh the next question is uh, how useful is uh, photobiomodulation in treating lichen planus and uh, the lesions of tongue i uh, this question is from dr shiraz pasha see basically there are lot of things which have come in the recent times and in the treatment modalities it's something like if i have to explain this the conventional method of treatment is always better no photobiomodulation is something i mean i I'm, i exactly don't know what exactly is this process but what i understand from this term at photo biomodulation probably it is you know mm, we we try to penetrate some amount of light into the into the lesional tissue and try to alter some cells in that area so i mean i'm i'm not actually very sure i'm, I'm just trying or assuming this could be this no no he is uh, referring to actually, the use of lasers use of lasers but actually it is modulating the interleukins and all those modulators which are there in the lichen planus lesions that inflammatory tissues what they are releasing the mediators 
so it is the actually the study shows that uh, pbm along with corticosteroid supplication it's more effective but okay. here also in this study also they have done it only in the cases which which are symptomatic that is with the burning sensation and severe lichen planus to reduce the pain and inflammatory reaction so as such lichen planus i feel you better not go for any treatment if it is asymptomatic uh, see from what i understand uh, from the responses i think uh, the light the use of light is basically to modulate the cellular uh, level is it yes level. Uh, cellular cellular uh -huh. see basically uh -huh. when we talk about lichen planus uh, we say it is an autoimmune disease and uh, at the same time we even call it as an inflammatory mucocutaneous disease yeah so because of this autoimmune concept or the autoimmune changes which are happening which are actually targeting on the t cells so that is giving rise to a inflammatory uh, response fine so we have different patterns of lichen planus we have reticular we have papillar we have plaque we have atrophic we have erosive we have bullous so reticular might be very you know Mm, it is a normal form at the same time when we talk about erosive or bullous it is more uh, probably mm, mm, what we can say it is more complicated or probably it is more severe because when it is a bullous form uh, when the bullet ruptures obviously it will it will leave a raw area below so so depends on what again what form of lichen planus it is based on that we can alter Uh, the treatment aspects but again the conventional standard form uh, remains uh, uh, the same for all kind of lichen planus uh, ma'am do you have something to add to this no no it's the same thing i think uh, ma'am i have a question here uh, when we are talking about lichen planus uh, the first thing that comes to mind is an autoimmune disorder but uh, having said this why is it that immune modulators are not the first line of uh, management for this and we go in for other management hello yeah yeah i can uh, hear you unair so actually though it is an autoimmune disease you know be uh, the first line of uh, treatment is not we are not using any modulator immune modulators here exactly ma'am why uh, actually it's uh, i think it is uh, i i think i may not be able to answer you correctly about this uh, what about dr salman salman dr salman can you answer this see basically immune modulators why do you give the immune modulators <clears throat> to to uh, to alter the immune system right not to modulate i think modulate uh, the yes. appropriate oh, okay yeah. probably modulate here in this uh, you know uh, in this pattern or possibly in this lichen planus uh, it is not that immune modulators are not tested there are studies which shows that uh, the immune modulators are been given to this uh, condition or to this disease but the outcome was not that great because the lesion is going to remain for a longer period of time so by giving immune modulators probably we might we might you know uh, alter the uh, complete immune system of that or complete uh, you know disease process I, I think it's a bit of a controversy here uh, when it comes to uh, like in plants always. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the next question then. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Gosia. Uh, was I'm so sorry. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Nadi Muhammad. He wants to know how relevant is Nikolsky sign clinically. See, Nikolsky sign is yes. How relevant in the sense if the presence of Nikolsky sign will give us an idea that, or we, we that will guide us towards the diagnosis of that. Excuse me. Basically, the presence of Nikolsky sign will yeah. guide us towards the diagnosis. All right, uh, ma'am. Uh, how clinically relevant is it, ma'am? in your clinical practice because you are a master in oral medicine yeah so. sir uh, nikolsky sign no like uh, as sir said it will really go uh, guide us to us the diagnosis or exact diagnosis because uh, yeah, nikolsky sign is not seen in most of the uh, lesions so i think it is clinically relevant only like uh, not, not present in all the lesions yeah it's uh, not present in all the lesions 
ma'am does it have something to do with the severity of the lesion as well yeah of course but in pemphigus and all it is a sign it's a main classical sign yeah, classic sign behavior. right it's yes. nothing See, uh, but, but what exactly is nikoski sign first of all when we try putting pressure on that the the, the surface peels off or it denudes denudes right so uh, when we have this nikoski sign it it is guiding towards the diagnosis it is completely taking towards the diagnosis for us this is clinically relevant only in terms of uh, making a diagnosis of that particular lesion yeah Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. We are very clear about this. Yeah. Yeah. The next question is from Dr. Rausia. Uh, she wants to have some examples of uh, combined red and white lesions. Combined red and white lesions, like for example, we can say uh, leukoplakia. You know, going into uh, erythroplakia. It's it starts with a white lesion and then it further proceeds to a, a red lesion. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Wasik Rafiq. I think this question is already answered. He wants to know what are the causes of uh, lichen planus. Autoimmune disorder. Yes. And the last question is from uh, Dr. Salman Basha. He wants to know oral hemangioma, your opinion or protocol on medical management. I think is, this is beyond the scope of uh, today's uh, topic. Yeah. Still what, what, like to, come, come again with the question, please. Uh, oral hemangioma, your opinion or protocol and medical management? Uh, oral hemangioma, if I have to tell you about oral hemangioma, vascular lesions, always complicated lesions. The diagnosis part itself is a challenge. Once diagnosed, when we are talking about the, the uh, I mean, like when we are talking about the treatment of this, if we have to go for a surgical excision, for example, I'm just giving you an example. A lot of considerations have to be given. Angioplasty, feeding vessel, blocking, or, you know, uh, we need to see embolization, yes. Embolization of the feeding vessel, then further proceeding towards the, uh, you know, uh, probably the surgical excision of this, and then post operative management becomes very important in vascular lesions so this okay. is what i could you know say about this uh, ma'am your closing comments on this question please yeah i think uh, oral hemangioma management i think dr naya you can answer more better yes. surgical yeah, no, i think this, this is exactly the reason why i said uh, this question is beyond the scope of today's topic yeah uh, so it looks like I think this is the end of the questions. I think I, I would really uh, thank uh, Dr. Amirunissa and Dr. Yeah, Salman uh, to have and give us uh, such a, a comprehensive uh, clarity and then uh, the responses in terms of the question and answers of the participants. Uh, I'm uh, giving back to Dr. Ali Mubarak. Uh, if I could get a minute, yeah, a, a small piece of advice to all practicing faculty. Please, you please. know, uh, with due respect to all other specialities, may it be endo, prosto, surgery, whatever. You know, uh, basically, an RCT can be postponed. A surgical impaction can be postponed. A prosthesis can be postponed. But have a basic knowledge about the oral lesions. Why? when you don't diagnose these oral lesions at the right point of time that might progress into a major malignancy and probably might lead to the death of the patient. So a, a specific concentration has to be given with this oral changes or the oral lesions, probably uh, not necessarily anything specific, uh, we can, it's not like something, uh, just because it is not my specialty, I'm not going to see that. No, have a basic knowledge about this and probably we, we will have, or we can save a life of the patient. Yeah, yeah thank you so much uh, for that uh, insight uh, on the uh, clinical uh, perspective, uh, Dr. Salman Siddiq. And uh, I would really uh, thank Dr. Amir Unisa also. And uh, I would like to uh, go back to Dr. Ali Mubarak, please. Dr. Thank Ali. You. Thank, thank you, Dr. You. Fidos. Uh, my apologies, I didn't introduce Dr. Amir Anissa. Um, oh, no problem, no, no problem, Dr. Ali. Thank you for your valuable time. Uh, finally, I wish to thank uh, our good uh, speaker and uh, able oral pathologist, Dr. Siddiq.
Well, thank you for your insight today. And I think we have learned a lot today and we're going to take in quite a bit into our clinical practice. And as you said, uh, diagnosing oral cancer or cancerous lesions or oral lesions is actually good for prevention of uh, fatalities. And I, I, I fully support your views. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. And I'm really sorry, I have to admit uh, that we've overshot our time by quite a bit. And I would be ending this uh, uh, talk today. Uh, Jazakallah khair and hope you guys have a good weekend. Thank we you so much, Dr. Ali. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you very much thank for you. Well, your support. We will, we will announce our future talks in the group. And if you do have any questions, please put it across in the group. And uh, you could follow this on our YouTube uh, video as well, YouTube channel as well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.